Well, good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church of Mishawaka, and we hope you are ready to worship the Lord together this morning. I want to begin by reading Hebrews 10, 11, and 12 as we begin. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. This morning we will be remembering the single and completely sufficient sacrifice for sins that Christ made in our place. Because of what he did, no further sacrifices are necessary. We don't come this morning to sacrifice to earn favor with God. We celebrate that Jesus has already earned perfect favor with God in our place and he has clothed us with Christ's righteousness. So that is what we rejoice in. That is what we celebrate this morning. And let's bow our heads and our hearts and ask God to help us to rejoice in that fully this morning. Father, we are grateful for the privilege we have to be able to worship you. We know that this is only possible through the blood of Jesus sacrificed in our place. That we can only be right with God because of what your son Jesus has done for us. And we rejoice that though we are still sinners, that you do not see us because of our sin or in the state of our sin. You see us as clothed in Christ's righteousness. And that this morning we can uh, repent and be clean. We're grateful for the opportunity to praise your precious name. And we ask that you would help us to turn our hearts and our focus to you. And that we would repeat the truth of scripture, not just as, as wrote, but as uh, a meaningful change in our lives. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please join us in standing together as we sing the power of the cross.
worshiping God, we do want to uh, give you an update stewardship-wise, um, as God has continued to provide for us uh, financially. We recognize that everything is from His hand. He provides for us each and every day. Uh, but if you would like to give, uh, you can do so by either going to give.fbcmich.org, or you can drop off your gift in the little drop box right outside Pastor Pete's office on your way out the door today. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for how you continue to show that you are God and we are not. We trust that we live and breathe because you give us life and breath. We pray that you would help us to, as stewards, as managers of what you have entrusted to us, our time, our talents, and our treasure as well, that we would re remind ourselves regularly that these are yours and that they are to be used and given for your glory and through your ministry that you have given to us. So I pray that you would help us to be faithful as a church, as stewards of the gifts that you have entrusted to us, and I pray that we would use them for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Mercy Tree, as we continue to remember the sacrifice of Christ in our place this morning.
together with me the italicized verses of Scripture. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, inflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Sing together, His mercy is more.
individual prayer before the preaching of the word this morning. Father, we're rejoicing this morning that though our sins are more than we can count, your grace absolutely overwhelms our sinfulness when we place our faith in Jesus to save us. That each and every day, though we sin, your mercy is more than enough. We can sing to you and not be afraid of your judgment or wrath because Jesus has already absorbed the wrath that we deserved so we can stand justified in your sight and for that we give you thanks we ask that you would continually give us hearts that are thankful that don't get tired of the message of the gospel that your grace overwhelms our sin we pray this morning as we come to your word and as our pastor comes and opens it up and preaches and declares your truth to us, that we would have ears to hear and hands and feet that are ready to obey as you lead us. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able to, would you please join us in standing once more as we sing together. Great one, three.
You may be seated. If you would, for our scripture reading today, open up your copy of scripture to Acts chapter 15. Book of Acts chapter 15. Together, or well, rather, I'm going to read for us Acts 15, 1 through 21. A little bit of a longer portion today, so be sure to pay attention. Acts 15, 1 through 21. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So, being sent out on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to, to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul, and they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Thank you, Will. Uh, long passage, so I appreciate you reading that for me. Uh, Acts chapter 15. I do want to just mention one prayer request. If you will pray for uh, my family this week, uh, we are traveling up to Michigan. Um, as many of you know, Tim Fink is the director of Bibles International. And Bibles International has their annual conference this week, and so all of their missionaries gather, and they have meetings, and, and Tim's asked us to come up and to lead the, the teenage group. So there's a group of uh, young people that are there that their parents are involved, in, and so we are going up this week, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and I'll be preaching up to a group of teenagers for uh, three days. So just be in prayer for us as we travel, and that just we'll have a, a great time up there. I um, also want to thank uh, Dennis and Doug for uh, doing the work up here. Um, some of you have asked about this. We're just trying to make more space for the worship team, and uh, they've done an excellent job. Uh, this will be carpeted by the time you come here next week, and also more parts of the building are going to be carpeted this week, and so we're just thankful for some of the work that is getting done. Uh, this week and next week, next week Pastor Will will be preaching, but we're going to both be looking at stories related to Paul that talk about um, disagreements and how disagreements are handled. And it made me think, and, and, and kids, I want you to listen for a moment. We, we talk about disagreements, and every, uh, everyone at times has disagreements. I mean, we see in the world today there's a lot of disagreements, but 
Uh, e- even maybe in our homes, sometimes you disagree, and uh, as, as kids, maybe you disagree with your brother and sister from time to time, maybe all the time, I don't know, um, but uh, disagreement. So how do we handle disagreement? So kids, what I want you to do, you have the clipboard, I saw some of you grab it, draw a picture for me of what it looks like to handle a disagreement. What do you do when you disagree with your brother or sister? And that'll be great, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, but uh, I want to talk specifically about the church, disagreement. A, a preacher told a story about a counselor who uh, spoke at a pastor's conference, and, and he decided to do a little experiment. Every time he introduced himself to one of the pastors, he would just say this statement, I'm sorry to hear about the conflict in your church. He was unaware of any conflict. He just wanted to see how pastors would react when he said that phrase to them. What he found out was interesting. About half the pastors replied, well, the conflict was here before I arrived. (laughs) Passing the buck, okay? About the other half of them said, uh, uh, said this, well, it's getting better than it used to be. What he found was interesting was only one pastor of the entire group responded by saying, what conflict? Now, it could be that he didn't have any conflicts, or it could be that he had multiple, and he didn't know which one he was referring to. But the idea there is, is that as a church, every church has conflict. Every church has disagreement. Uh, the, the, The point is, is that we as a church are filled with sinners, and so we're going to have disagreements. Now, many of the conflicts we find in church are really unnecessary conflicts. They're, they're conflicts that we need to avoid. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3 says this, It is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife, but every fool will be quarreling. Uh, this means that it's foolish for us to argue and debate about everything. And we're going to disagree. We're going to find things that we disagree with, and and it does not mean we don't ever disagree. It does not mean we don't ever vocalize our disagreement, but what it does mean is is that if we're constantly looking for a fight, then we're foolish. However, in this passage today, we're going to talk about what Paul describes as, uh, later on, a good fight, a necessary fight. Some issues that rise up in our world and in our church must be upheld at all costs. And the leaders in the early church understood that that one of those areas was was, um, salvation. And it must be clear, it must be understood, and it must be held onto at all costs. Now, before we get into our text, I want to review with you where we've been. So, uh, just a map to remind you, Paul and Barnabas left from the Syrian Antioch and they traveled through Cyprus and preached and taught there and impacted many people, Jews and Gentiles, and then they traveled up to, to uh, the Poseidon uh, Antioch and if you remember there, they were, uh, they, they were mistreated and they, and they fled and, and then they traveled down to Iconium where they also were threatened with, with, uh, to be killed and so they fled from there and they went down to a town called uh, Lystra, which, where Paul was stoned. If you remember in that town, they, uh, they, the, a man was healed, and so then they were raised up into the level of God, and then they said, no, we're not gods, we're common men. And uh, because of that, and others that joined them, they were, uh, Paul was stoned, he was left for dead, he travels to Derby, and then they go back through the whole list of those cities again before finally they travel back to Antioch. And so they're back in the Syrian Antioch, and uh, it is estimated that that first missionary journey that we see here took about two years. Uh, So it was about two years that they traveled, so it's been two years since they had returned back to their sending church. And so they go back to their sending church, and Acts chapter 14, verse 27, tells us they arrive and they declare all that God has done. So basically, this is the first recorded um, um, missionary update that we see in in, in Scripture. Uh, They probably stayed in Antioch for a few weeks, even maybe even up to a few months, and we see what begins to happen in in what Pastor Will read in chapter 15, that a disagreement, and this is the first point here, a disagreement arose over salvation by faith. So I want to talk a little bit about this disagreement. First of all, I want to see the intensity of this disagreement. Look at verses 1 and 2. So these men came down from Jerusalem to Antioch and began to teach these people. 
Now, who were these men? Well, uh, theologians referred to these men as Judaizers. Basically, what that means was they taught a combination of of God's grace and and salvation by faith uh, with human effort. And their desire was that in order to be a Christian, this is what they taught, was yes, it was faith, but also you need to keep the Jewish laws and customs that they had kept for many, many years. Now, these men that came from Judah uh, down to, or uh, down to, as it says, down to here, that's topographical, not, uh, not according to a map as we think of it, but uh, J- Jerusalem was higher up. And so they came down to Antioch. They began teaching. These men were not sent by the church in Jerusalem. They went on their own accord. We see that in Acts chapter 15. If you look, verse 21, it says they went on their, came on their own, and, and they came to this church, and, and they began teaching. Now, look at verse 2. Uh, Paul and Bar- Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. This created, this teaching was creating a contentious debate within this church. It's referred to as no small dissension, meaning this was a big deal. Okay, in, in, in our world today, this was like church split worthy. Okay, they were, they were having a huge disagreement. I, I was reading one commentary, and one commentary, the author said this, he described it as a brouhaha. <laughs> you know, a, a brouhaha is a controversy or a fuss that seems afterwards to be pointless or irrational. Uh, and, and this gives us the idea of much to do about nothing. And, and I agree with that definition, except for the idea that I don't think it was much to do about nothing. It was much to do about something rather important. It was a major problem. It was shaking the very foundation of, of biblical salvation. And it needed to be addressed. If it wasn't for this event in chapter 15, I think it would have impacted all of history as far as the church is concerned. So this was a major event. And because of how serious this disagreement was, Paul and Barnabas and others, as it tells us there, were appointed to travel to Jerusalem to discuss this with the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. And so this is a big deal. But what is the issue of the disagreement? Second thing. Verses 3 through 5 tell us uh, they, they um, travel down, they, they stop along the way uh, visiting other locations, telling about what God has done, about the conversion of the Gentiles. And then verse 4 it says, And they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. And so they arrive in Jerusalem, and they're greeted, they're welcomed by the church as a whole, uh, but also by the apostles and the elders. Remember, Paul and Barnabas had both been in Jerusalem, and so they would have known all these uh, apostles and elders, and they probably would have had some familiarity with them enough that uh, they, they just kind of interacted for a little bit. And after the pleasantries were over, Paul and Barnabas gave a ministry update of what God had been doing in their ministry, but it was, pr- it was, it was time to get to the problem at hand. Now, we're talking about the Apostle Paul. This is not necessarily primarily a Paul story. Um, But I felt this was a critical event in the history of the church. And understanding this, what took place at this council impacts so many of Paul's writings. I felt it was essential for us to talk about it. So what was the problem? What was the divisive question? And basically it comes down to this. The divisive question was, how is someone saved? How does someone become a Christian? See, these false teachers, they had it right and they also had it wrong. See, they had it right because what they were saying was there was only one way. There wasn't multiple ways to God. There was one singular way. But the problem was, is what they had it wrong was which way? See, they were requiring faith in Jesus Christ, but they were also adding to it error. They were adding to it the necessity of male circumcision and strict observance of the law. They were teaching that faith in Christ alone was not sufficient to please God. And though circumcision is not an issue today, 
Uh, these, these are, there, there are contemporary parallels to this ancient era. Things like, unless you're baptized, you cannot be saved. Or, unless you te- keep the Ten Commandments, you cannot be saved. Now, it's not likely that you're going to ever encounter this type of teaching in our church. But, I want to caution you because I think that this type of false teaching can creep into our thinking. A Christian who feels that we somehow must earn the approval of God in order to go to heaven is doing the same thing. And though we wouldn't verbalize it, we wouldn't say that, we would say, yes, I know, salvation is by faith alone. But yet, at the same time, there's times where in our lives, the way that we act, there's this this sense where we think, well, I, I, I have to be this certain thing in order to be pleased by God, in order to go to heaven. And we're committing the same error. And so this disagreement arose over salvation. So let's talk a little bit more about this disagreement and what happened next. And so a, a, the second point is a defense was made for salvation by faith. Now, let's look through this. So it tells us there in this passage in verse 6, if you look at verse 6, it says, the apostles and the elders were all gathered together to consider this matter. At various times in, in the history of the church, church leaders have met to discuss doctrinal issues. Historians, in fact, recognize seven church councils just in the few, first few centuries of the church. Um, of those seven, one of the most significant ones is the, called the Council of Nicaea, which was held in 325, and there, there are many others. And these councils were held to discuss erroneous teachings and condemn them, but also biblical positions were often established and carefully defined. And as important as all those other uh, church councils are, I believe this Jerusalem council was the first and most significant all because it fixes one of the most uh, momentous doctrinal questions, and that is this. What does a person need to, be, need to do to be saved? What do we need to do? The apostles and elders successfully resisted the pressure that was being imposed on them by Jewish legalists and ritualists that uh, were saying that these Gentile believers needed to do all these things that were taught in the law in order to be Christians. And in other words, what they were doing was they were they were including uh, they were saying they needed to include works. And and thankfully, the apostles and the elders pushed back on that. They opposed that dramatically. We see three things about this council that I want you to notice. First of all, salvation by faith produces confirmation. So here we see in verse 6, they're all gathered around to discuss this matter. You see in verse 7, it goes on and says, there was much debate. I believe that, you know, it was going back and forth, maybe even got heated at times. Maybe there was even some, some loud discussions of people saying, no, 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 this is what I think, and others standing up. And, and we see in verse 7 that Peter stood up. Now, as we know, Peter is a, you know, is a excitable guy. Peter's a guy that likes to be in the center of everything. But I, I imagine this scene, I imagine all this debating is going on, and maybe it's gotten, maybe it's gotten a little e- even heated, and Peter stops up and says, hey, let's stop for a moment. And everyone quiets down. And what does he do? Well, first he reminds them of something. Look at uh, verse 7. He says, brothers... You know that in early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Uh, This is probably a reference to a time when God told Peter to go to speak to the Gentiles and specifically to a man by the name of Cornelius. And he went and, and shared the gospel with a guy by the name of Cornelius. And so it's, it's fitting that uh, Peter's the first one and speaks because he got this message directly from God. In fact, they knew that. Turn back to Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 11, we see Peter then uh, goes and, he's, and he tells 
the, the church about, he reports to the church about what's taking place. He reports about, in chapter 10 was when he met with Cornelius, when he had his vision, and, uh, and, and he tells uh, the church about it in chapter 11, and look specifically in verse 17. Peter speaking, he says, If then God gave the same gift to them, that means to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, as he gave to us when we believe in Jesus Christ, who was I that I should stand in God's way? In other words, what he's saying is, is God gave them salvation and they didn't have to conform by doing circumcisions or any of these other, uh, other things. He says uh, in verse 18 then, then uh, when, when they heard these things, when the people around heard these things, when the church heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, to, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. So they had already affirmed this with Peter, but now Peter stands up and says, hey, I want to remind you that God had already sent me to do this. Then he goes on, and and going back to chapter 15, he goes on and he continues in verse uh, 8, and he says, And God, who knows the heart, bore witness in them. How? How did he confirm in them? that they were believers. What does he say? By giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He reminds them of that. That even though they did not do the expectation that these Jewish legalists had on them, yet still they received the Spirit. And he continues on. And he says, And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. See, what Peter is doing here is he's affirming that God has already begun to work. It's experiential. He's seen it happen. He's seen Cornelius. He's seen these other people come to Christ, Gentiles, that had not uh, done these Jewish uh, uh, requirements. They had not done them, and God made no distinction between the Jews and Gentiles. In fact, he had cleansed them. And he says, so I think he's affirming a couple different things. He's affirming that God looks at the heart. It's not about the external. He, he uh, is also affirming that, that God confirms salvation through the giving of the Spirit. And so we see here what Peter stands up and is basically saying, hey, is there salvation that comes by faith? And we can see confirmation of that through the work of the Spirit. But secondly, the second part of this, Paul, Peter doesn't stop there. He continues on and he says Salva- or a relationship based on rules leads to captivity. Look what he says next, starting in verse 10. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test? Do you remember when you were in school and uh, you would get a, a test and you'd take a test and, and you'd get to the end of the test? And I'm sure most of you at some point did this. And you'd finish the test, and I remember doing this. I remember one particular teacher that I had, and, uh, and I didn't agree with the teacher's answers. <laughs> and I remember going up to this teacher and going, uh, I just want to, I have a question about this one, and what's your question? Are, are you sure this is really the answer? And, and her looking at me going, I wrote the test. Yes, I'm positive. But I don't think you're right. I really think this is the answer. Nope. You're wrong, I'm right. It usually doesn't go well when a student confronts a teacher about a test. And, and, and that's what Peter is saying here. He's saying, uh, that's what they're doing. Why are you testing God? God wrote the manual. In, in fact, the word here for testing is a Greek word which means to examine for the purpose of finding fault. Peter says to them, why is it that you're trying to find fault in God's plan? Well, the problem was is there was so much skepticism. I mean, it was just a different world. I mean, these, these Jews had learned that in their life, they had been taught, they had been raised to, to follow the rules, to follow the guidelines, and you got to do this, and you got to do this, and you can only wear certain things, and on Sabbath, you can only walk a certain distance, and, and you can only eat certain things, and, you can all, and they had all these rules, and they had followed them for so many years, and, 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 and they had to have this thought, surely there's more to the gospel than just have faith in God. In Jesus Christ, surely there's more to it. I think for them, it was about, that can't be enough. 
There's got to be something else I have to do to get the approval of God in order, whoop, in order to be saved. There has to be something. And then Peter goes on and says this. Look at verse 10 again. He says, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on, your neck, on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have had the ability to bear, have been able to bear? What Peter says is this. We have struggled, people, under the weight of these rules and laws for centuries. It was literally a yoke that crushed us. We tried to keep the laws, yet we failed time and time again. So why do we think that this is okay? But you know what I think is that we often fall into this trap of what do I need to do to get God's approval? How, how do I stay right with God? I mean, I, I, I've got to go to church, right? I've got to give. I've got to study the Bible. And, and not just study the Bible. I've got to do it the right way, at the right time, the right method, the right frequency. I, 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 have, to, I have to say the right words. I have to check, 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 check things off my list in order for God to be pleased with me enough to go to heaven. You say, you know, Pastor Pete, I don't think that way. I think if we're not careful, this attitude creeps into every single one of us. And it's a legalistic idea. In fact, it's a legalistic idea that Paul addresses in the book of Galatians, which many people believe Paul actually wrote before this Jerusalem council, but he talks about that. God has called us not to be a captive, not to be imprisoned by rules and laws and regulations. God has called us to freedom. Yet we captivate ourselves. A relationship that is based on rules is captivity. If, if I, in my relationship with my wife, think that way, we're not going to have a good relationship. If I say, oh, you know what, I'm not going to uh, do anything to hurt my wife because I don't want to upset her. Is that what a relationship is about? No. If I say, oh, you know what, I'm not going to be unfaithful to my wife because if I'm faithful, she might be upset at me. You know, I've captivated myself, but if I do it this way, you know what, I love my wife. I adore my wife. And because I love my wife and adore my wife, I wouldn't even ever think about wanting to do anything like that. Do you see the difference? But I think too often as Christians, we do it the other approach. Oh, if I step out of place, God's going God's to be angry at me. No, God, I adore you. Does this mean that my ma- conduct doesn't matter? No, that's not what I'm saying. Read James. James talks about faith without works is dead. There is an obvious thing there, but the trap of faith performance will lead you to doubt and fear. And and here's the, the, the bottom line of why this impacts the purity of the gospel. What you have to understand and what we have to remember is I did nothing, absolutely nothing to earn my salvation. It was a free gift of God. There is nothing that I can do to keep my salvation. It's sealed. It's sealed through the promise of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing I can do to lose my salvation because it's been made right through a covenant relationship that Jesus made because of his death on the cross. So I did nothing to earn it. I don't have to do anything to keep it. I can't do anything to lose it. Why? And a couple of our songs alluded to this today. I, I, I don't know if Pastor Nate's, you know, getting ready to leave, and so he's picking all of my favorite songs, but he did that this morning. But uh, a couple of the songs this morning alluded to that, that idea that it's not because of me. And that's the idea that Peter's getting across. It's, it's not through me. It's not about me. 
It's for him. It's by him. It's through him that I can do all things. We have to be aware of this trap. And that's why Peter says, why? Why are we putting this yoke on us that God never intended to be there? Get rid of it. Get rid of it. If you're here this morning because you think that's what God's going to, you know, if you're not here, God's not going to be pleased with you, then that's the wrong reason to be here today. If you're here because you adore your heavenly Father and you want to be here to worship Him, that's why you should be here. I hope you catch the difference because it is drastic. And so Peter finishes speaking and he sits down and we we see in verse 12 and all of the assembly fell silent. I'm, I'm getting a glimpse of that right now. They went quiet. What does it say next? And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. I don't know exactly what they said, but I believe what this was, this is my opinion, is what this was, is that Paul and Barnabas stood up after Peter and said, let me give you examples of what they're talking about, what Peter's talking about. We have seen Gentiles, we have seen people come to Christ in in extraordinary ways. And it wasn't about what they did. It wasn't about how they earned salvation. It wasn't because they were good enough. Maybe maybe Paul told them the story about Sergius Paulus. Remember him? He was the the governor who came to Christ. And and maybe Paul told the story about this guy who was, was a Roman. And yet God impacted his life. And he didn't have to conform to some law or some regulation or some requirement. Yet it was evident that the Holy Spirit came into his life. And and Paul and Barnabas began relaying these stories. They were firsthand accounts of how the work of faith was seen in Gentiles just as much as it was in the Jews. And this leads to our last point here. The word of God affirms the gospel for all. So Paul and Barnabas, they finish speaking and they sit down. And then next, look what happens next. Verse 13, after they finish speaking, James replied. Now, I I, I believe that, you know, here we see Peter has testified about the the gospel going to the Gentiles and the yoke uh, that was there because of the law. Peter and Barnabas kind of echo that by talking about how uh, God impacted Gentile people. And, And up to this point, basically what they're talking about is all experiential. What they've seen happen, what they've seen displayed. Now James stands up and speaks to the, for the first time. Now you've got to remember, James was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. In fact, James pastored the church in Jerusalem for about 18 years. And so he led these people. And so even though the council consisted of some strong leaders like Peter and Paul, James, who, who wasn't necessarily the same boldness of them maybe, James stands up and I, I, I believe he probably presided over this council. I believe he was probably kind of the leader of the group. And he stands up and everyone gets quiet again. And what James does is he does something interesting. He acknowledges the reports that was just given. Look, we see there in verse uh, 13. uh, He says, brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. He's like, I... Paul, uh, Peter just told us about the experience. Yes, he saw how Gentiles came to Christ, regardless of whether they followed the law or not, and how they came to Christ and all of that. And then he adds to that, look what he says in verse 15. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. So he does something interesting. He then, he then says, okay, all of this is true, but I, I want to show you how the Bible confirms this. And what he does is he quotes from the book of Amos. And, and he says, and, and you can look in Amos, it's uh, because of the, the language difference, there is some variables in wording, but it's very similar. He says in verse 16, after this, I will return, this is God speaking to his people, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen, I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. Okay, so the desire is that man will seek God. And he says, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. He says, here, James tells the people, hey, Amos already told us about this. 
That God had prophesied through Amos long before that there would come a time when all the nations of God would seek his face, not just the Jews. And and I believe this impacts how we do church today. We are uh, the people of God collectively coming from different experiences, different uh, parts of the world, uh, coming together with different backgrounds, different races, different economic experiences, but we all come together because we're all God's people. But what's important is this. I think what we need to understand is this. I think what James was trying to get across is this. James doesn't allow the experiential report from Peter, from Paul, and for Barnabas uh, to be enough. Although it's true and it's testifiable, he doesn't allow it enough. He doesn't allow it to stand sufficiently on on its own. He teaches us this idea that I must connect what I experience with what the Word of God says. This is an important lesson, I think, for all of us. How does the Word of God validate my experiences? See, we oftentimes today, as as human beings, we're very experiential, aren't we? You know? uh, We we go somewhere and we... uh, uh, we, we see something going on and we're like, every time I go in that store, this happens because it happened to you once. <laughs> and we sometimes become a very experiential. What James is saying is, I agree with everything Peter, Paul, and Barnabas just said. But he's like, I, I want you to think about, I want you to see how the word of God confirms that. And we should uh, filter what we hear through what Scripture says. The Word of God matters. It's true, it's reliable, it's perfect, it's without error, it can be trusted. Here's the truth, is my emotions, my experiences can't always be trusted. So I must filter what I experience, what I see, what I hear through what God says. And that is why it's so important that every day you take time to study the Word of God. Because as a Christian, man, we can get so lost in our experience. We need to be in the Word of God. Not because I have to check something off my list, as I said a few moments ago, but because I want to know what God says to me because I love my relationship with Him. So then, in just a moment, I want to tell you how how James concludes. James concludes in verses 19 through 21 uh, and basically what he says is this. Okay, now, here, here's what God says. Therefore, this is what we need to do. And, and he kind of sets an action plan. Look what he says in there. He says, uh, we should uh, not trouble those who are Gentiles to turn, uh, not to turn to God, but should write to them. He says, we're going to write to them. We're going to write out a letter. We're going to send it out to Gentile believers. And, and we're going to send this out. Now, uh, they had... They had just said, uh, just previously, that circumcision and following the law and those things are not um, uh, necessary for salvation. And so when he lists these things, he's not saying, hey, these things are necessary for salvation. What he is doing here is the aim and objective of what he's about to say is based on Christ-like unity. We don't have time to go into detail of everything that James said here, so uh, I I just want to summarize. He mentions three things for them to do. He says, abstain from from things offered to idol. He says, abstain from sexual immorality and abstain from the use of blood. Again, we don't have time to get into detail. I I, I challenge you to study what that means, study what those are. Uh, But basically what he's saying here is this. These are things that were regular part of the, the Gentile uh, and many times the pagan practice that these things would be involved. And, and for a Jew, this was, was hard for them to grasp. And, and what he is saying is, is this is not uh, a necessary um, part of salvation, but what he's encouraging, and Paul brings this out more as we get into the Paul's writings, but Paul brings this out more. He's saying this, is, is the aim was unity. 
The aim was fellowship. The aim was taking two groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles, and making sure that they live in harmony as one, living out the gospel. And and Gentiles living out this faith would be in a position to fellowship with Jews that were living out the faith uh, in Jesus Christ. And so it was avoiding being a stumbling block. And so James says, hey, here's the plan. We, you know, we're not, we're all in agreement here, right? That it's by faith and these things don't need to be added to it. But let's just encourage the Gentiles to not be a stumbling block to the Jews. What is the point of this whole thing? And three things that I want you to think about as we close. First of all, you need to ask yourself, have I experienced my faith? Have I experienced salvation by faith alone? Are you trying to add anything to your salvation? I choose, uh, secondly, I choose not to think I need to do anything uh, to be accepted by God for salvation. And then third, I commit to filter the world that I live in, the experiences that I have through the lens of the word of God. I challenge you to do that. This is a very important passage uh, that really impacts the writings of the rest of the New Testament that we have to be stand firm on. And yes, it led to this disagreement, but I, I believe at the end there was, there was um, unity. Now, maybe there was still someone that disagreed, and they went their own way. But they stood for what truth was. And they said, hey, salvation is by faith alone. And all these other things, yes, God wants us to please him. Yes, God wants us to love him, and that means we're going to do certain things. But that's not what causes our salvation. And so I think it's an important chapter, and I hope it was a benefit to you. Let's pray. God, we are grateful um, for this passage. We're grateful for the impact it has had. Lord, we know even today there are, there are other religious groups. There are other people who have, um, in, in many ways, um, forgotten the teaching of this, the, what this council established. And Lord, I pray that we as a church will, will stand up and, and say, this is what we believe. This is what's right. We are saved by faith alone. The work of Jesus Christ was sufficient for us. And God, we are so thankful for that. So Lord, I pray that you help us to have the right view of, of the, the work that we do for you. That it's not part of our salvation. It's part of our relationship with you. Lord, and I just pray that as we go through life that we will take our experiences and we will filter them through the word of God and ask you what you say about everything that we do. We just thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond to the word of God through singing together the glory of the cross. Please join us in standing together as we sing.
Well, as we close our service together this morning, uh, we want to continue to uphold the Corson family in prayer. And uh, some of you have asked uh, how you can uh, help financially. You can certainly uh, write a check to the church and designate it the Corson family, and that will all go to them. Uh, if you want to give online, we have a fund set up there as well that you can designate to them. Um, so you can be aware of that in a way that we can tangibly obey what the scriptures tell us to do there. So let's, let's bow our heads and our hearts together as we close in prayer. Father, we are grateful for how you have shown your love to us in the face of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. We thank you that we can rejoice around your throne because of the cross, and because of the empty tomb. We pray that this week you would help us to be uh, faithful to your word, uh, that we've heard even taught this morning, help us to continue in these things. Um, not because we seek to earn your favor, curry favor that might perhaps gain us entrance into heaven, but because we love you and because you have redeemed our lives from the pit and because we know that we have a home guaranteed because of Christ's perfect work. And may he be glorified in our lives, we pray this week. We ask for those who aren't able to be with us this morning, uh, those who perhaps are ill, those who are uh, staying home and watching online. We uplift uh, the course and family together and ask that you continue to give grace to them, give mercy to them, uh, allow them to have comfort uh, at times, especially where it's uh, difficult as they are um, dealing with the separation from uh, husband and father, Brent. And we, of course, rejoice that he is with you, but we recognize that separation is very difficult, and we ask for their um, continued comfort and strength physically and spiritually and emotionally. And we pray that this week um, you would help us to be your church to serve you. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Hey, First Baptist, let's talk about what's going on at our church. Tonight, we have our get-together at the Large Pavilion at Central Park to say goodbye to us. Callie and I would love to see you there at 6 p.m. Dinner is provided, and next Sunday is our final Sunday at FBC. We're trying to resume our children's ministries, but we still need some workers in order to staff them fully. If you would like to serve in nursery, tiny tots, or children's church, please call the church office or email us at info at fbcmish.org. We have been doing some light renovation projects around the church the past few weeks, and new carpet will be installed in a few areas this week. Please pardon our mess in the meantime. We promise that it will be worth it when everything is finished. Finally, if you're new here at First Baptist, thank you so much for worshiping with us. If you stop by our guest center in the annex, you can pick up one of the gifts that we have set out for you. Have a great week, First Baptist.